Our scripture reading this morning is from Amos chapter 9. And we're going to look at, at basically the last five verses in, in Amos. We're going to look at verses 11 through 15. Amos chapter 9, 11 through 15. In that day, I will restore David's fallen tent. I will repair its broken places, restore its ruins, and build it as it used to be, so that they, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from the hills. I will bring back my exiled people, Israel. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make their gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for, for this passage in, in, in Amos. We, we pray, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to help us understand what we've read this morning. And we pray, as always, Father, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be pleasing uh, to you. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the last week in our series in Amos. Uh, the title of the series has been Back to the Start. Uh, we've been looking at those times that, that maybe we need to get back to the start in our faith. Maybe we need to start over. Maybe we need to return to a point where we can grow again in Christ. Uh, we've been looking at the Israelites in Amos' day, and we've seen how far they've strayed away from God. We've seen that they were worshiping pagan gods, pagan idols. Uh, they had basically abandoned their God. And something we haven't pointed out yet, Ezekiel is a contemporary of Amos, written about the same time, within 10, 15 years or so. And in Ezekiel, there's a time where Ezekiel had to lay on his right side for 390 days. Could you imagine having to lay on your right side for 390 days? He was in the street, very public place, lying on his right side for 390 days. But the, what was significant about the 390 days was that the Lord told him that's one day for every year of disobedience for the Israelite people. So this isn't something new in Amos' day. Israel had been disobedient for almost 400 years at this point. And, and he had sent a number of prophets already at this point. He's going to send a few more before the actual exile comes. But he's been trying to work with the Israelites to try to bring them back and warning them what's going to happen if they, if they keep up this course. Um, last week we saw that God wants our obedience. And if you, if you learned anything from last week, I hope it was that, uh, that just going through the motions in worship, just doing those religious things you think you're supposed to do, won't help you at all unless you're living lives of obedience to God. That's what God wants to see. Uh, and, and we saw that the Israelites weren't doing that. The Israelites were living for themselves. They were... Uh, they were doing whatever, the, whatever pleased them. They were worshiping whatever pagan God might have pleased them, not for God. And, and last week, we also saw the importance of uh, living lives of integrity, of being who you say you are, of doing what you say you're going to do, and, and the idea of justice and what biblical justice means. It means giving a hand up to somebody who needs a hand up. It means helping someone who, who can't stand up for themselves. It means being there to help those who don't have anybody else to help them. And then we saw the importance of righteousness, being right with God, having that relationship with God, that, that people, we all were created for that relationship for God. We need to be living for Him, not for ourselves. This week, we, we turn to this last reading in Amos, and, and, and it's a turn in the, in the book of Amos. There's a turn. Instead of talking about an upcoming doom and destruction, he begins talking about a promise. He gives good news. Instead of judgment, he gives us hope. We see that while things will be hard for a while, it's not going to last forever. There's going to be some tough stuff they're going to have to get through. But there's a light at the end of the tunnel. There's, there's hope. 
to come. That bad stuff won't last forever. Now, I kind of want to go through this passage, since it's a short passage, I kind of want to go through it verse by verse to see what he's really telling us. Then I want to tell you something that I got out of this passage and see if you agree with me here. But, but the first verse we read said, I will restore David's fallen tent. Now, Shelly would probably tell you, she's down in digging right now, but this week as I was going over this verse, I could not figure out what that meant. I was really puzzled by that. I, I just, for a couple of days, I was reading that and rereading that and looking up on the internet what I could find and, and consulting different correspondences. You know, usually in a verse it has a somewhat clear, literal, physical meaning behind something. And then maybe if you look hard enough, you see a spiritual meaning behind it. Well, I could not find the literal, physical meaning of that verse. What does he mean he's going to restore David's fallen tent? Now, literally, David's fallen tent was the tabernacle, right? David didn't have the temple. David made all the plans to build the temple, but God said, no, your son's going to build that temple for me. In fact, we call it Solomon's temple, right? So David didn't have a temple. David had the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. That's David's fallen tent. So what does it mean that he's going to literally restore David's fallen tent? And I could not for the life of me. I think it means something. I, I think it's significant that it's worded that way. I just have to confess, I don't know what it, what it is, the literal physical meaning of that. I can tell you that there's a pretty clear spiritual meaning in that God is going to restore David's kingdom. He's going to restore the righteousness of the Israelites at the time of David. We know that ultimately the Israelites um, were restored back to their land. In fact, the temple was rebuilt. Nehemiah, Ezra rebuilt the temple. Uh, but that passage wasn't really fulfilled until Jesus Christ came. We know that, that God promised to have a descendant of David's on the throne for all time. And, and that was restored, that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. We know that Jesus was God's son. We know that, that he was divine, that he was fully God. But we also know he was fully human. And his human lineage can be traced back to David. So Jesus is the descendant of David that will sit on the throne for all time. And I think we, we know that. We can understand that. Um, we see that fulfilled in Jesus. So we have a clear spiritual meaning. While I don't quite figure out the literal physical meaning, if there is one to that verse. Um, so I have to stop and think about that. If we don't see a clear literal meaning, physical meaning, that, then maybe it was never meant to be taken literally. Maybe it's meant to be spiritual. And if that's the case, then maybe the verses that follow are meant to be taken spiritually. And that maybe these are blessings not to be literally fulfilled in a physical sense, but to be spiritually fulfilled, still every bit as much fulfilled. Um, so, so let's kind of think about that as we go on and take a look at these other verses. Uh, the next verse says, They may possess the remnant of Edom, and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord who will do these things. Now, Edom was an enemy of Israel. Uh, they had fought off and on as long as Israel had existed. Uh, it, Edom was kind of a sworn enemy. They battled quite regularly. And this verse seems to be saying, if you look at a literal physical meaning, seems to say that, that the Israelites, when they're restored, that they're going to overthrow Edom, that they're going to possess that land, and they'll never have to worry about those pesky Edomites again. If I were to write a version of the, of the Bible, I would have that term in there, pesky Edomites. Uh, never have to worry about them again. But, you know, I'm not sure that's what it means. Because we never see it. Israel is never restored as a self-governing country that could, that could wipe out the Edomites uh, after the exile. And, and then we see another verse. In my Bible, in the NIV, there's a footnote to that verse. That points us to the Septuagint. Now, anybody familiar with the Septuagint? Where's Leroy? I was hoping he would raise his hand. 
The Septuagint was the first translation of the entire Bible in all one language. It was written in Greek about the third century. It was getting to the point that there were so many Gentiles coming to faith in Christ, and, and the Gentiles couldn't read Hebrew. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. So they developed a, a translation of the Bible in Greek. Old Testament was already in Greek, so they translated New Testament was already in Greek, so they translated the Old Testament into Greek, so we had one full Bible written in Greek. The reason I give you all that background is that the Septuagint words that verse a little bit differently. It says, so that the remnant of men and all the nations that bear my name may seek the Lord, declares the Lord. Now that's quite a bit different. He's saying, so that the remnant of men, all men, not just the Edomites, And all the nations that bear my name. So all nations who declare Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior may seek the Lord. So Amos seems to be saying that we're going to possess the land of the Edomites. But it's translated in the Septuagint as we're going to bring the people together as, as God's people. In the, in the family of faith. Now, now, this verse is also quoted in Acts 15, verse 17, and it's a little bit different yet, but it's closer to the Septuagint. It says that the remnant of man may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things. So, so what does all this mean? I think that Luke's theology, his understanding of God, and remember, as an author of the New Testament, God spoke to him. God pretty much told him what to write, right? So I think his understanding comes directly from God. And Luke's understanding is that all men who seek the Lord will be restored as God's family. He's going to bring them all together. Amos is talking about not a literal defeating the, the, the Edomites so we can possess their land. He's talking about bringing the Edomites and the Israelites together in one family of faith. And the Septuagint and, and Luke and, and Acts chapter 15 is saying the same thing. We're going to bring all men together in one family of faith. That's pretty great, isn't it? That opens the door for us today to come into that family of faith. So, so what is the promise? If the promise is for all men, not just Israelites, what is the promise? He gets into that in the next verse. Verse 13, he says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper overtakes the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. That's an indication that the harvests will be so full and so plentiful and so rich that, um, that before they're even done with the harvest, they're plowing for the next batch. And they're sowing seeds, and as they're sowing the seeds and planting the seeds, that, that the harvesters are already coming through to harvest things. And then by the time the harvesters are done, the plows start again. And by the time the plows are done, the sowers start again. And, and it's just a continual process. A, a rich and productive land like we've never seen before, right? On and on and on. Plow, sow, reap. Plow, sow, reap. Over and over again and again and again. Verse 14, it says, I will bring back my, exi my exiled people Israel and they will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. You know how long it takes to rebuild a city? I don't. I have no idea. I guess it's going to depend on the size of the city, how badly it was damaged, who knows. But it takes a long time to build a city, to really build it up to city status. So it's going to be a long time. And they're not only going to rebuild the city, but they're going to live in the city afterwards. That's an indication that they're going to be there a while. In fact, the next verse, the passage ends up with the verse that they will never again be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. Never again to go into exile to a foreign land. We'll possess that land from then on. Now, now we know enough about the history of Israel to know but that was never really physically, literally fulfilled. 
that they did return, but they weren't self-governing. So while they possessed the land, at least a remnant possessed the land, it wasn't the nation of Israel again until 1948. It's a long time. 2,500 years to the fulfillment of that prophecy. If 1948, the UN establishing the nation of Israel as it is today, if that was a fulfillment of that verse. If it was a fulfillment of that verse, 2,500 years is a really long time to fulfill that, that prophecy. Maybe Amos wasn't talking about a literal, physical meaning behind these verses. Maybe he's talking about a spiritual meaning behind these verses. And if that's the case, what could it be? I read something from Charles Spurgeon this last week that, that says Charles Spurgeon believed that that was a, it, that it was a spiritual meaning and that the spiritual meaning was a call to revival. That that's what it meant. That these verses were a call to revival. Now, to explain this a little bit, Charles Spurgeon lived in a time of great revival in, in England. And and quite honestly, Charles Spurgeon thought just about every verse was a call to revival. He was a powerful preacher and could preach on revival, I think, from any verse in the Bible. Um, but as I was thinking about this, he makes a pretty good case for this being a call to revival. And the reason is that if it's a spiritual meaning, not a literal physical meaning, then that call to revival makes as much sense as anything else. So I began looking at, that verses, at those verses from, from that angle. What do we see from the spiritual angle of a call to revival? The first thing I think we see is that this is a great promise that could be applied to a spiritual renewal, a call to return to God, right? It, this promise of a great harvest, maybe it doesn't apply to grapes, to vineyards or to plants or gardens. Maybe it applies to the church. Could it be that the plentiful harvest could be a reference to a time of revival that's going to come? We know the statistics today, 80% of people claim to be Christians, but only 20% or so attend church. If we were to look out on our streets today, we could say, the fields are ripe for harvest. There's a lot of people who need to hear about the Lord. This reading talks about an immediate sense, doesn't it? As soon as the, as the plows are done, the, the seeds are sown, and the harvesters begin. Gardens don't really work that way, do they? Anybody have a garden? P people have... You folks who have a garden know things don't happen that quick, right? Right? You, you might plow or till, and, and then you let it wait for a little while. And then maybe you add some fertilizer, some manure or something, you, you till it in again, you let it wait a little bit longer. Then, then you sow the seeds and you wait a little bit longer, actually a lot longer. Uh, and, and then you weed a little bit, and you wait a little, bit, a little bit more. And then finally you see things start to come up. It's not immediate like that, is it? It takes a long time. It takes a long time to get something out of a garden. And, and then when you do get the harvest in, the plowmen aren't already coming in to prepare for next season and planting right away. There's a long wait. You've got to wait till next spring before you can do anything else. So it's not an immediate thing, right? It's not one thing after another after another. But you know what? That's how grace works. Grace can work that way. You see, when God plants a seed and it begins producing fruit, there's no time requirement at all. It could happen like that. It could be just that quick. And one of the signs of revival, at least one of the things that has to be present for revival to begin, is that everybody's at work. God's spirit pricks our spirit, and, and we get involved in what's happening. And great things begin to happen. In Amos' time, when, when God pronounced judgment on Israel, it wasn't the last word. You see, God didn't give up on his people. He didn't give up on the human race. He's not going back on the promises that he made to Abraham 
that Abraham's offspring would be his chosen people. He didn't give up on them. He may have brought us into fellowship with them, but he didn't give up on them. And he's never going to give up on them. Because our God keeps promises. And we need to remember that, because God made some pretty incredible promises to his church. And he's made pretty incredible promises to us. And we've got to understand that as long as, if God was ever going to back out on a promise to us, it would have been before his son went on the cross. If he was willing to go that far, he's willing to go however far he needs to go. If he was ever going to back out on a promise, it would have been then. But he's, he, he didn't, and he's not going to. He's going to keep all of the promises. So we see a promise of a great revival here in this passage. I think we also see, and this is the second point here, I think we see that God will do it. You see, it doesn't depend on us. And and you know why I say that? That it doesn't depend on us to do the work? Because nowhere in that passage do we see the word if. He doesn't say if his people come back to him. If his people return to the law. If his people turn around. If his people do what I ask him to do. If his people... That's not what he says. He says there will be a blessing, that he's going to pour out that that blessing. It's just a promise of blessing. He's not waiting for the people to turn around. He's just going to bless them. God is sovereign. God knows our hearts. And, And here's something that I think might be a little bit harder for us to understand. I'm not sure, but but God can kind of You you could say he holds the key to our hearts, that he can kind of move us in a particular direction. He can kind of call us to work in a particular way. Now, that's not stepping on our free will. We always have that choice to say no. But I think that God can so fill us with his grace and his his love in our lives that, that we're just drawn to him. And we just naturally follow him. And it's unlikely that we would choose anything else when God shows that kind of love to us. Uh, He can draw us into moving toward him. So God will bring revival. And the truth is, only God can bring revival. But he's going to move us in such a way that we're going to have a part of that. And, and that's going to come in just a minute. But, but let me just say that looking through this book of Amos in this study might have been a, a little discouraging when we saw how far the Israelites had strayed at that time and, and maybe for how long they had strayed. And, and maybe because when we got home, we thought about the state of the church today and we realized that, that, that we may have strayed a little bit too, that we don't always take care of people the way we should, that we don't always help people the way we should. We're not always serving maybe the way we should. But there is hope because God promised that he would bring revival. And and he will do it. He will do the work. But the third point, that he will use us, that he will draw us to involve us in the process. We have a responsibility in the revival to come. See, we're going to be the ones who are plowing and sowing and reaping. God's changing hearts, that's something only God can do. And and he will do it. But we participate with him in the harvest. God works through his church to accomplish his things in the world today. Now here's the thing. We don't know when this revival is going to come, do we? Maybe it already has. There were several huge revivals to happen. Maybe that promise has already been fulfilled and it's not going to happen again. But I don't think so. I think there's going to be further revival in the world. And I believe, I pray that it's going to happen soon. Our role as the church is to be about God's work so that when the time for revival comes, it will happen. See, we don't know when that's going to start. So we need to be at it now. 
We need to be at work now. We need to be sowing seeds now. I, w- I want to share a parable with you from Matthew. Um, if you've got your books open to Amos, it's only a few uh, chapters. Amos is almost to the end of the New Testament. Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. Um, Matthew chapter 13 has the parable of the sower. Now, some of you are probably familiar with that. Probably quite a few of you are familiar with that. Um, but chapter 13, and I'm going to start reading in, in chap- verse 3, a farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seeds fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked out the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop. A hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. As we look at that parable, let me ask you a question. Is the farmer going to be judged because some of his seed didn't produce fruit, didn't produce a crop? No, he's not, is he? The farmer's job was to sow the seed. And the farmer sowed the seed. Now, I guess we could try to justify that in saying that a good farmer would try to sow the seed in good soil. But if we're looking at this from a spiritual aspect, we need to understand that we don't always have the discernment to know. Our job's not to judge. We just sow the seed. The farmer in the story just sowed the seed. We as the church, part of our role is to sow the seed. I want to divert from that a little bit, kind of put my wife on the spot a little bit, Um, because when you live in a pastor's family, you're always game for an illustration. We had been married for 10 or 11 years, 12 years maybe, and we had moved from Florida back up north here. Our son, Stuart, who is 27 now, something like that, was only a baby then, not even a year old yet. We'd moved into an apartment in West Seneca, New York, just outside of Buffalo, and we had this girl that lived upstairs, and Sandy would talk to her in the hallway every once in a while, and just kind of plant seeds, just kind of make statements about her faith, whatever, and she started asking questions, and our church didn't give out our daily bread, so we got them delivered to the house, and when we were done, we, she would pass those along. To that girl. So she was reading them like three months behind, but she was reading them and she'd ask more questions. And Sandy led her to Christ because of just sharing those seeds like that. That's what that verse is talking about. Just one-on-one building relationships, sharing seeds like that. She's working with a lady now who has Parkinson's and a little bit of dementia. And she's been doing the same kind of thing. She's been sharing little statements with her here and there, just telling about her faith in that. And And she started there about a year ago. Well, she just shared last week that she's been opening the Bible every once in a while and sharing passages from that Bible. And the ladies asked if we could come and give her communion. Um, Just one-on-one, sowing seeds and reaping the harvest. Met a guy at lunch yesterday. We went down to uh, Bloomsburg. And there was a big motorcycle valley rally down there, easy riders. They, They can be a pretty tough motorcycle group. They were having a big rally at the fairgrounds, and we went to, our local chapter went to Bill's Bike Barn, which is kind of an old bike museum just outside of town, and and they were having a ride that afternoon. Now, we didn't actually ride in the ride, but we just kind of, when we got there, the place was packed. There were thousands of people there, I think. And we kind of moseyed through the crowds and kind of broke up into into small groups and kind of moseyed through and, and just enjoyed the museum and and talked to people as we saw them, not necessarily evangelism, just relationship building and seed sowing, that kind of thing. Afterwards, we stopped at lunch, and and we talked to this guy who was uh, was with us. He was going back to the fairgrounds to, to do some ministry there in the heart of the rally, but we were talking to him, and, and he shared that he drives a school bus, 
and that at the beginning of the year, he, he just starts those innocent little statements, planting seeds, and he says, by the end of the year, there's always a few kids that are asking him questions, and he has a chance to share the gospel as a school bus driver. Now, maybe you think you live, in, maybe you work in a place where, where you don't have that freedom, but if they ask you, you can, right? You can always answer their questions. So, so plant those seeds. We as the church need to be about planting seeds. Because if a, if a revival is coming, that's our role, is to plant the seeds and to be ready to work with the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy in our lives. We thank you, Father, that, that while you do things only you can do, you, you've decided to use us in some way in that role as well. And so we thank you for opportunities to participate with you, to sow seeds with those we might need, to just innocently and casually make statements and plant seeds until others ask questions. Thank you. And open those doors for us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen.